Hey guys, how's it going? This is Joseph Matthews, and in this little tutorial, I'm going to teach you how to be funny. And uh, it's actually going to be much easier than you think. These are just some simple tricks that I use to add humor to any interaction, and I know that they're going to work really well uh, for you. Alright, so the first thing I want to talk about is how serious humor really is. You know, uh, if you can't be funny when you're talking to someone, you really can't be all that interesting. The fact of the matter is, the funnier you are, the more fun you're going to be, and the more people want to hang out with you. So, you know, you need to be as funny as you possibly can in order to attract the most attention. But the thing is, is that you don't have to be funny all the time. You know, you just need to be funny when it's appropriate. And some well-placed laughter will bond a lot of good feelings to you from, you know, the people that you want to basically impress. So the first thing I want to talk about is how humor is really a sign of intelligence. You see, only smart people really know how to be funny on purpose, okay? And when you make people laugh, they subconsciously associate your ability to be humorous with a high intelligence. And this puts you in a position of authority. And this is really important because, you know, if people hold you in high regard, that gives you a higher social status. And we all know women are attracted to people with a high social status. It just It's in their nature. So the funnier you are, the higher you can raise uh, your social standing in any pretty much any situation you find yourself in. And here's another key that I really want to hammer home, and, and that's the idea that you don't have to be funny to be humorous. Don't worry about trying to be funny, okay? It really doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of what you say to be funny will not work, and the reason for that is that everyone has a different sense of humor, okay? Just being goofy and lighthearted will generate the same type of emotions that funny people do, even if you don't make people laugh, okay? The, the idea here is that you want to project the intent of being funny. So that kind of takes the pressure off in the sense that, you know, you don't have to actually perform. You don't actually have to make people laugh. You don't actually have to tell them good jokes. You just have to have the intention to make people laugh and make people have a good time, and they'll pick up on that and appreciate that. Another big thing is, I don't want you to be afraid to mess up, okay? Being funny is an art form. You won't always succeed, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try, okay? Now, in our efforts to be f funny, you know, stuff happens, you know? Sometimes you might insult somebody, sometimes you may, might take something too far so that it stops being funny, sometimes you might say something inappropriate in the setting that you're in. You know, this is going to happen if you want to try and be a humorous guy because being funny is about taking chances. It's about doing stuff that's unexpected and sometimes it can backfire on you. But if this happens, don't worry about it. Just apologize and move on, you know? If you say something that's inappropriate or insulting, just say like, look, in all seriousness, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I was just trying to be funny. Um, can you forgive me? All right, that, that's all you need to do if you take things too far. Um, so don't worry about messing up because Everyone knows what it's like to try to be funny and bomb. Um, you know, it's happened to everyone at some t point in time. So if, if you just acknowledge it and you ask for their forgiveness, they will usually grant it to you. Okay, and another thing I want to point out is the fact that humor is not hard to do. See, a lot of people think it is, but it isn't. The truth of the matter is that anybody can do it. If you think you aren't funny or entertaining, don't sweat it. You can be, and you will be. Okay, believe that it's possible for you to be a funny guy, even if you aren't. This will help you a great deal. I know a lot of guys out there are saying, like, oh my gosh, I'm so boring, I have no personality, I can't be funny. Okay, get rid of that belief right now, okay? It's possible for you to overcome that, even if you're, like, the most boring guy on earth who speaks with, like, a monotone Ben Stein-type voice. Bueller, Bueller, you know the guy I'm talking about. Okay, even if you're that guy, you can still be humorous, okay? You just have to go with it. You can't be, you know, clinging to that belief that, you know, you're just not a funny guy. You can be and you will be, and I'm going to show you how. Okay, so let's talk about the elements of humor, and these are just quick and easy things that I personally use to be funny when I'm around women, and I'm pretty sure you can use them too. Okay, the first one I want to hammer on is this concept I call immaturity. Okay, 
And basically, immaturity is, is that, you know, everything that was funny in the first grade is still funny when you're an adult. Okay, grown adults acting like children isn't funny, but grown adults talking like children is. So, you know, if you're like throwing a temper tantrum or whatever because you didn't get your way, you know, no one's going to find that funny. But if you start talking like a baby, but you still act like an adult, you know, that is funny. So uh, let's just go over a few examples here. You know, like uh, if you were ever a kid and you're on the playground and someone took your toy and you got mad at them, you'd say, you're a doo-doo head, okay? You know, and when you were a kid, you know, saying stuff like you're a doo-doo head was funny. Um, so let's take that now when you're like a grown man. You know, let's say... Uh, a girl says or does something you don't like, and you just kind of look at her and squint in your eyes and say, you're a doo-doo head. You know, that can be funny, all right? Uh, another thing is, uh, for instance, girls are icky. How many times growing up did you and, you know, your friends run around saying, girls are icky, all right? Everyone's heard this stuff. Uh, women who've been around kids have heard this stuff, you know? Um, so... You know, like, let, let's say a woman comes to you and says, like, hey, you know, I've, I've got a friend I really want to hook you up with. You can just tell her, ooh, girls are icky, you know, or, or something like that. You know, it really doesn't matter. You're just taking stuff that sounds immature, and you're applying it to your grown-up adult persona. Uh, another thing is uh, you got cooties, okay? That, that, that's a big kind of thing that immature kids, you know, run around talking about. So, like, let's say you're out on a date with a girl, and, you know, uh, she's having, you know, you're having dinner, and she says, oh my god, you know, the mashed potatoes are so good, you gotta try some. And, uh, she, you know, she holds out her fork for you to, like, try a little bit of potatoes, and you just say, ooh, no, you got cooties. You know? Stuff like that. Like, it might not get, like, a big belly laugh. Um, you know, sometimes it, it can be if, if it's an unexpected, but most of the time, you know, it's something that's, like, kind of fun and immature and, and humorous. So, you know, again, we're creating these feelings that you're going to be a playful type guy when, when you act all, Im I shouldn't say when you act, when you talk immature. All right, the next concept I have, uh, I couldn't think of a really good way to, ex to kind of ex encapsulate this with a word, so I call it going plaid. And this is really a lame Spaceballs reference. If you've ever seen the movie Spaceballs, um, they have uh, light speed, they have hyperspeed, and then they have plaid. And uh, going plaid means that uh, you're going so fast that uh, you actually turn the color plaid, you know, which is like a mishmash of all these different colors. Um, and basically, th I, I use this concept to explain that um, you, you take a complaint or a criticism that someone uh, makes of you, and you own it. And then once you own it, you take it way further than anyone ever really expected you to, Okay. Um, so let, let me give you some examples of this. Let's say you're out with a girl and, and you say something kind of stupid and she says, Ugh, you're such a dork, you know, but she says it in like a fun way. Like she doesn't really mean it. She just says, says oh, you're such a dork. And you can respond to that by saying, you're right. I, I, I am a dork. I'm the king of the dorks, as a matter of fact. Uh, we, we always get together once a year and uh, have an election and I've won like the past 12 dork years in a row in a row and uh, wait till you see my uh, massive Star Wars figurines collection back at home. You're, it's going to make you so hot you won't be able to resist my dork-like charms. You know, That's what I mean by going plaid, is you take something that will, could be considered something that's negative, and not only do you own it, but you take it to its most ridiculous extreme. So, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, you, know, you say something kind of funny, and a girl kind of says, jokingly, Oh my god, you know, you're weird. Okay, and uh, you know, you, you take that and you're like, you're right. I'm the weirdest guy you're ever gonna meet. In fact, I bottle my own urine and keep it in my refrigerator, uh, and label it uh, based on you know the time of day and you know um, what month it was. You know, and and that's not weird at all. You know, I just think that, you know, it's kind of cool. So you you take stuff and you bring it to an extreme and maybe maybe the urine thing you know I just did that off the top of my head maybe the urine thing was going a bit too far but you see what I'm saying you know if a girl says you're weird you say you're right I I am weird but you know you must be weird too because you're hanging out with me you know you take it you go to the extreme uh, another one is when a girl says oh my god you're so mean you know this will happen a lot of if if you do a lot of teasing so if a, if you're teasing a girl she'll be like you're so mean why are you being mean to me. And you just look at her and you just say, 
I'm because I'm a mean person. Duh. I mean, <laughs> you know, what are you stupid? Of course I'm mean. I'm the meanest guy you're ever going to meet, you know. You must be a, a masochist because when you hang out with me, I'm going to be so mean to you. So that's what you got to do when you go plaid is you got to own the stuff that people say about you and you got to take it as far as you possibly can. Okay, the next kind of concept I want to talk about is dick and fart jokes, otherwise known as racy humor. Okay, now a lot of guys kind of shy away from this stuff, but you can't be afraid to joke about inappropriate stuff with women. Okay, um, sometimes guys are afraid that uh, it might be too sexual, it might scare the girl off or whatever, but the fact of the matter is, girls love dirty jokes as much as guys. And, you know, in the off chance that they don't, if it is inappropriate or, or it's not their type of humor, you know, once you find that out, shy away from it. Don't do it again. But, you know, you should always not be afraid to kind of go out and, and give it a try. So some of the things I like to kind of lump in with the whole dick and fart joke mentality is um, exaggerating what women, you know, find attractive. Okay. Um, so, like, let's say that uh, women like tall guys, okay? Uh, I'm not saying all women like tall guys, but let's say you meet a woman who, who does like tall guys, and you're like, oh my god, you know, um, you know, you're so into tall guys, like, you know, you, you like, like, the eight-foot giant people, you know, everyone's a, everyone's a, you know, a midget to you, because you only like guys who are, like, ten feet tall. You know, that's what you can do, and, and you can point out, like, really tall guys, and be like, you see that guy right there, over there? Yeah, he's not tall enough for you. Okay, he could be like, you know, a basketball player eight feet tall. You'd be like, no, he's, he's not tall enough for you. You know, you like taller guys. You like taller guys than that. You know, so it, take some stuff that women like and exaggerate it. Um, accuse them of being sexual deviants. This always, <laughs> this always works really, really well. Um, I don't know why, but, uh, you, you know, when, when you look at a girl and, and, you know, you start accusing her of being into, like, some crazy stuff, one of two things will either happen. She'll either um, completely deny it, in which case you take it further, or she'll play along with it, in which case you take it further. Okay, so um, let me think of an example of this. Uh, just be like, uh, you, know, you know, you could uh, look at her and be like, oh my god, look at you, you know, like, I bet you're like the type of girl who loves to be like tied up and spanked. You know, like, that, that totally seems like your personality. Like, you're, you're the spanking girl. You just love to spank people. You know, or, you know, you could also take it be like, oh, my God, like, you're such a dominatrix in training. Like, I bet you have, like, a bunch of whips and chains at home, and you can't wait to get me home and violate me in all sorts of d different weird ways. You know, like, you're scaring me. Like, I really don't want to hang out with you right now. Okay, like, that's the type of stuff that, I mean, when you talk about accusing them of being sexual deviants. Um, another thing is uh, talk about how they want to rape you or take advantage of you. Now, this is a little bit of a role reversal thing because, you know, a big fear that women have when they're dating guys is that they're going to be raped or they're going to be taken advantage of in some way. But you can actually use this to your advantage by turning it around and saying stuff like, uh, like for instance, you know, if, if she brings you a drink and you say, like, you didn't slip a roofie in this, did you? Because, you know, the last thing I want to do is uh, wake up in bed and find out that you completely took advantage of me. You know, or, or you know, if she gives you a drink and you say, like, are you trying to get me drunk? Because, you, you know, I, I'm not that type of guy, <laughs> you know. Um, stuff like that, you know, you, you want to you wanna kind of accuse her of being the one trying to get you into bed, okay, or trying to take advantage of you in some way. And this is funny, but it also has, like, some underlying sexual tension aspects to it, which uh, can be really fun. Um, another thing is to make fun of bodily noises, you know, like, uh, everyone thinks, you know, fart noises are funny. And, uh, you know, you can just sit there and be like, you know, with your mouth, just go and then accuse her of being farting. Just look at her and be like, ew, I can't believe you. Ew. You know? Um, and, you know, it, it's funny because it's obvious you're the one doing it, but you're accusing her. So, you know, it, it gets some laughs. And uh, the last one is to accuse women of having outrageous fetishes. Okay? And, and this is stuff that w where you take, the, like, the most mundane thing and you turn it into a fetish. Okay? So... For instance, like, let's say that uh, you're talking to a girl and she's complaining about having to go to the optometrist to get her eyes examined. And you can say something like, you know, you don't fool me. You know, I know your secret. You know, you're, you're, you have an optometrist fetish. Like, you have optometrist porn at home that you secretly jerk off to, and uh, you can't wait to go to the optometrist because, like, you're in love with the optometrist. 
you know, you take mundane stuff and turn it into a fetish. Like, uh, you know, lo lots of girls love to shop for shoes. So you say, like, oh, my God, you have such a shoe fetish. Like, you know, if, if those shoes were like a man, you'd totally have sex with them. You know, that, that, that's what I mean by turning stuff into outrageous fetishes. Okay, recall humor. Recall humor is basically uh, taking what was funny once and continue to have it be funny again. And this is really where inside jokes come from. So basically, take something that you both thought was funny, that you both laughed at, and reference it again whenever you want it to be funny again. Um, so l let me give you some examples of this from my own life. Um, there's a TV show on USA Network. It's called uh, Psych. And it's about this guy who pretends to be a psychic and uh, helps the police uh, solve murders or whatever. And there's a lot of really funny lines in, in this show. And, you know, me and uh, a girl, I, uh, we, she used to come over to my place and watch the show with me because I, I got her into it. And there was one episode where there was a line that the main character used, and he basically said, um, are you a fan of delicious flavor? And, you know, me saying it right now, it's not all that funny, but in context, it, it really was. So me and the girl laughed really hard at that. And so every time I'd call her up, uh, I'd start off the conversation by saying, hey, are you a fan of delicious flavor? And she'd, of course, say, yes, I am. And I'd be like, well, then I got a treat for you. And then I'd talk about something cool that we were going to do. So um, that that's a good example of recall humor where you take a, a, an experience that the two of you shared, the two of you had a really good you know, laugh at, and then you bring it up and you apply it to other stuff. Um, another example of this is, uh, you know, if you've ever seen the movie uh, for, uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, which is kind of this romantic comedy, um, there's a part in there where uh, this guy basically meets this other guy, he's British, and he, he says, you sound like you're from London. You know, he kind of does this uh, impersonation of, like, a British accent that says, you sound like you're from London. And I, w I went to go see this movie with a girl when it was out in the theaters. And this girl couldn't stop laughing when uh, the character said that. She just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. So um, every time I get together with her thereafter, uh, one of the first things out of my mouth is I'd look at her and I'd say, you sound like you're from London. And she'd just start laughing, and she'd smile, and stuff like that, and it was fun. It was recall humor. Um, but it d doesn't always have to be like, you know, lines from TV shows or movies or something like that. It could be something that someone said. And it doesn't even have to be all that funny. Like, for instance, uh, I used to date this girl, and she would have to work in the morning, so she couldn't, like, you know, stay out too late or whatever. So basically by 10 o'clock or what have you, like, she'd have to be at home and in bed. And she used to say, uh, you know, that... Uh, you know, if she doesn't get home in time, she's going to turn into a pumpkin. So uh, I would use that. And whenever we were out, I'd, I'd look at the time and say, like, uh, uh-oh, you know, like you're only a couple minutes away from turning into a pumpkin or something along those lines. And it was, you know, it's this kind of fun thing where you have this inside joke that, like, no one else really gets except the two of you because you're the only ones that really experience that. So if you've ever had that experience with a girl, be sure to call it back up and use it when you need to. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is ambivalence, and this is actually one of my favorite um, ways to be funny, basically. And what ambivalence is, is it's basically you look forward to something bad happening, or you take pleasure in someone else's m misfortune, and you're also kind of unresponsive to bad things. And the reason that, that this works is because these types of reactions are really shocking and surprising, and because they're so unexpected, they are therefore funny. Um, I'm going to use an example of this. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Private Parts by Howard Stern, uh, there, there's a whole scene in there where he talks about um, being in Vietnam and uh, thinking it's unfair that you know uh, that they miscounted the number of confirmed kills he got because what he did was he he went and he found a a school full of uh, full of Vietnamese children, threw a grenade in there and killed like 80 of them. And when his sergeant, uh, you know, came to count the bodies, he said, you know, Private Stern, these are kids, uh, that counts as one kill. So, y y you know, th this kind of horrible story about, you know, going to a, a school and killing like 80 children but and being upset that it only counts as like one kill, 
that that's an example of ambivalence. You know, you're taking this horrible, horrible act in 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 wartime, no less, and and bragging about it and being upset that you know you didn't get credit for all the for killing all those children. You know, so that's kind of an example of of ambivalence where uh, you take something bad and you actually kind of take some type of delight in it. Um, so a, a little bit of a better example of this, um, like let, let's say you're talking to a girl and she's complaining about how she works really hard but she never has any money. You know, she's like, oh, I'm so poor. You know, um, you can take a lot of glee in that. You, you can be like, like, yep, you know, looks like you're going to have to start, you know, stripping or walking the streets or something like that. You know, you're going to need to make some extra money. You know, you, you just kind of take pleasure in the fact that, you know, she's poor and you start, you know, kind of trying to get her to do all these terrible things to, you know, make money. Like, you know, like, looks like you're going to have to be a drug mule. I'm going to have to fly you down to Mexico and shove condoms full of cocaine up your butt and then take you back across the border in order to, you know, help you pay rent. You know, I mean, th th that's a good example of ambivalence. Uh, another thing is basically, you, you know, um, being unresponsive to bad stuff. Like, for instance, the whole global warming thing. Like, people are all about global warming. We gotta save the planet. We gotta, like, do this. We gotta do that. And you could be like, you know, ah, screw glo global warming. I'm cold now. You know, like, <laughs> you know? It's like, I, I, I want it to be hot. You know, like, I, I want the world to, to be warmer because it's, it's freaking cold out and I don't like the cold, you know? So that's another example of ambivalence. And, you, you know, ambivalence really stems from just, like, being lazy and not caring. Okay, that, that's how this humor works, is everything that someone says to you, like, you can just be like, eh, you know, whatever. And uh, it's funny. All right, here's another thing um, I, I call gayness. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, gay people are bad or, you know, whatever, but you got to admit that gay people are funny, you know, gay men. Masculine men doing feminine things is always good for a laugh. Um, and stories are also always much funnier when they're told in a gay voice. So, you know, whenever you're hanging out with a girl or whatever and you start talking gay, um, she's going to enjoy it. She's going to laugh because it's something that's, like, different from who you really are, which is, you know, hopefully, you know, a straight, heterosexual, masculine man. Um, so... You know, like, sometimes uh, I'll, I'll be like, hey, it's gay story time. And then, like, I'll tell, like, you know, a normal story that I was going to tell anyway. Um, but just do it in a gay voice. Be like, I, you know, I'll say something like, oh, honey, you don't even know. Like, oh, my God, the thing with the thing and that guy. Oh, my God, I can't believe he said that, you know. I'll just go off and I'll riff, but I'll do it in a gay voice. And women, you know, for some reason, I don't know why, they always love it. I don't even think my gay voice is all that good, to tell you the truth, but they like it. Okay, and another great way to use gayness is to pretend to be one of her girlfriends, you know. Like, uh, if a girl starts talking about, you know, like something that she'd normally talk about with her girlfriend, I'll be like, wait, pause, pause one minute. I'm just going to take my balls, I'm going to put them in this imaginary jar here, like, er, er, okay, I'm putting my balls away. I'm totally your girlfriend right now. Just talk to me like your girlfriend. So, sweetie, what's the problem? You know, and then, you know, so it'll be funny and she'll laugh and then she'll start telling me. So you can do a lot of stuff about, like, you know, kind of emasculating yourself, um, acting gay, talking gay, things like that. And, you know, women like it. Okay, another thing is ridicule and teasing. Um, here's an interesting fact, is that people hate to be made fun of when they're the ones being made fun of, okay? They, they hate ridicule when they're the target, basically. However, people love it when other people are made fun of, especially people in authority or people they personally don't like, okay? So, you know, let's say you're sitting down with a girl in a restaurant for dinner and your waiter's like, you know, a, a real jerk or he's not a very good waiter or whatever, uh, you could start making fun of that waiter. You know, just start, you know, ridiculing the guy. Don't do it when he's around, but as soon as he leaves, just turn to the girl and just, just be like, like, oh my god, that guy's asshole is puckered so tight you couldn't pull a pin from it with a tractor, you know? And uh, she'll be like, oh my god, yeah, you know? And, and that brings up another thing, is that when you make fun of other people, it creates a sort of bond between the two of you, because... It's almost like you're, you're confiding in them your dislike of something else, and you can be united in your dislike for something. Um, so if 
she talks about something that she doesn't like or someone she doesn't like, pounce on that, start making fun of it, and she'll start making fun of it too, and before you know it, you two have created a bond over that. Okay? So, um, use ridicule to ridicule other people, but never, ever, ever ridicule yourself or the girl that you're with. Okay? Um, when you turn ridicule on, on someone else, they, they'll tend to get defensive or, or it'll lower their self-esteem or what have you. What you want to do is, is if you're going to target the girl that you're with, tease her. Okay? And there's a difference between ridicule and teasing. Okay? Good-natured teasing is funny, but if you take it too far, it becomes ridicule. Okay, so uh, when you tease a girl, um, it's it's kind of you know I'll use an example that we used in the past where you know you start making fun of uh, of an outrageous fetish that she has. Okay, like let's say she really likes Brussels sprouts or okay I got a better one. Let's say she really like likes Chinese food. Okay, and she's sitting there she's like oh my god this Chinese food's so good and I'm just like oh, look at you you know uh, you're so into Chinese food. If Chinese food were a man you'd totally have sex with it. You know, that, that's an example of teasing, but, you know, like, looking at a girl and saying, like, oh, my God, you look so fat in those jeans. You know, that's not teasing. That, that, that's being mean. So you want to walk that fine line. So, but if you ever got to ridicule someone, always ridicule someone other than yourself or the girl that you're with. Make sure that it's someone that she doesn't like or someone in authority, like, for instance, the president, you know. Even if she likes the president or she dislikes the president, whatever, it's always funny to make fun of people who have some type of authority position. You can also make fun of her boss or, you know, your boss or whatever. Someone that has some type of authority over you. Alright, the next one that I want to talk about is impressions. Now, the fact of the matter is everybody loves impressions, you know, even the bad ones, okay? Um, so... If you want to be funny, when you're telling a story, always do impressions of the different characters that are in the story. You know, it could be a story of you and your friend Bob. And uh, every time, you know, Bob says something, you do it in the Bob voice. And the Bob voice can be something like a really high-pitched, whiny type thing. Um, uh, there's a, a guy in, in my group of friends, and uh, his name is, is Adam. And me and my friends always do impersonations of Adam. Um, whenever we tell stories, and when I talk about my friends to the girls I'm with, I use the, this Adam impression. And it's kind of funny because, you know, Adam, he has this really deep voice, but when we, <laughs> when we do our impression of him, we make him sound like a complete idiot. So we'll say like, mm, yeah, mm, yeah, I really like that, yeah. And that, that's our Adam voice, okay? And it totally sounds nothing like him, nothing like him, but it's a funny voice. So like when we tell the stories to the girls and we use our Adam voice, the girls really laugh, and, and they're like, does he really talk like that? And you're like, no, actually, he's got, like, a really deep voice, but we just like to use that, that voice. And before long, you know, sometimes the girls even start doing the impressions like that. So you don't even have to worry if you can't do good impressions. Like, do bad impressions, and then brag about how bad they are. So, for instance, uh, like, let's say you're doing an impression of the girl you're with. You know, like, obviously it's hard for guys to impersonate female voices, so you can just do it in a really high-pitched, shrilly voice. It's like, um, oh, I'm so tired. I don't want to go out. Uh, why are you making me go out to dinner with you? I don't even like this place. You know, you can start pretending like that's, like, your, your, your impression of her. And she'll be like, I don't sound like that. And you're like, I don't sound like that. You know? And it, it's a bad impression, but, you know, it's funny. And uh, an, another way you can do this is do impressions of celebrities or really well-known people, you know? Um, you know, if you're talking about the, the president, do an impression of the president. doesn't matter if it's good or not. Just, you know, use what, take what you've seen done on TV and try and emulate it best you can, you know. Um, people really respond well to impressions because it's, it's kind of like this theatrical performance. Even if it's not very good, like, you're creating a whole new character that, they're, that they can get into. All right, the, the next thing I want to talk about when it comes time to be funny is talking with stereotypes. Now, all stereotypes are funny because there's always some measure of truth to them. You know, even if they're completely offensive and out of the out of left field, they're still funny. So, for instance, you know, if you're like an uptight white guy like myself, you know, throw in some ghetto speak. Um, when I uh, meet up with a girl, like if I call her up on the phone, one of the first things out of my mouth is sometimes, "Hey, what's the dilio?" 
you know? I don't really talk like that. I don't say, like, what's the dealio, you know? Like, it doesn't sound right coming out of my mouth. But, you know, when I'm calling up a girl and I want to be funny and playful, I use, like, what I like to call ghetto speak, which, you know, like Ebonics and, you know, stuff like that. It's like, call her up, hey, shorty, what's happening? You know? <laughs> I mean, like, really, you know, dumb stuff like that when it comes to me saying it. Now, on the flip side of that, if you're a ghetto black guy, talk like an uptight white guy, you know? Uh, Dave Chappelle does this really well, where he has this very white voice that he uses sometimes. And it, that's funny, you know, because you're you're kind of playing into this stereotype that white guys have, like, this very proper diction, and, you know, they're very uptight. Um, if you're an Asian guy and you, and you want to talk like Hong Kong fooey, you know, uh, with, like, the Asian voice, you know, go for it, because Asian guys can pull that off. Um, even though it's, like, very offensive and stereotypical, it's funny. Uh, if you're an Indian, talk like Habib, you know, like the, the guy from The Simpsons. It's like, think you've come again, you know, that type of thing. Um, and you, you can get away with it because you're Indian, you know. Uh, if, uh, you know, other people were doing it, it might be offensive. But you you got to take stereotypes and instead of being offended by them, use them to your advantage. And when you do this, you want to take, take those stereotypes and blow them way out of proportion, you know. Like, just take them to their furthest extreme. People love it. Okay, another thing is sarcasm. And uh, sarcasm is probably the easiest type of humor to do, but it's the hardest to appreciate. Uh, the more intelligent someone is, the more they can appreciate sarcasm. But um, just a word of warning here, people with low self-esteem, they don't really like sarcasm, okay? Um, because it can come off as, as being really offensive. Um, there's the show that used to be on Comedy Central, uh, I don't know if it still is, but it's called The Kids in the Hall. And uh, it was basically a sketch comedy show, and they had a sketch on there um, called The Sarcasm Man. And basically it was this guy who had a speech impediment where everything he said sounded really sarcastic. And people, <laughs> people were always pissed off with him because it always sounded like, you know, he was just like making fun of them. So, uh, you know, someone would come up to the guy and they'd be like, hey, you know, like, my name's Jim. What's your name? He's like, oh, hi, Jim. My name's Bill. You know, and then the guy'd be like, "Dude, why are you being so mean? Like, I just came up to introduce myself to you." And it's like, "What? I'm not being mean." <laughs> you, you know, and it, it went on like that for like you know, a good you know, ten, fifteen minutes, where the guy was was just getting more and more upset, and the guy would be, have to be, have to explain like, "Oh, I'm not being sarcastic. I have a speech impediment. It's a real problem." And you know, that was kind of like the the, the punchline to the whole thing. So, basically, when it comes to sarcasm, you basically got to act like the person you're talking to is a complete idiot, and you have to lower yourself to their level in order to effectively communicate with them. That's basically what sarcasm is, is, is you have a feeling of superiority over the person, and, and you're kind of poking fun at the fact that they're dumber than you are. And, oddly enough, lots of girls really love sarcasm. They really love sarcastic humor, and a lot of a lot of girls, as a matter of fact, have a very sarcastic sense of humor themselves, like their type of humor is sarcastic. Um, so if you're a guy, you, you tend to got to put up with a lot of sarcastic women. So, And an another thing I just want to point out is a lot of the stuff I've been going through with you guys with um, so far in this presentation is stuff I've learned from women. Like this is all humor that I've gotten from girls that, you know, made me laugh. And I kind of sat down and was like, what is it they do that, that's funny? And it, it's very easy for, like, a girl to act like, you know, she's better than you, and she's smarter than you, and she's got to talk down to you in order to, to do that. Um, if you're dealing with sarcastic humor from someone else, play into it. Just just act like you're a complete retard and be like, Durr, uh, you're right, uh, man can't talk, you know. Just go with it. Um, if someone's kind of treating you like that, take it to its, you know, logical extreme. Um, when When you're dealing with someone who's sarcastic, you can pull the sarcastic humor all you want. Um, but if you're dealing with someone who's not sarcastic, who has, you know, low self-esteem, is kind of like sweet or whatever, you don't want to go the sarcastic route. Okay, another thing I love to do is use nicknames. Um, nicknames can be a lot of fun and they can be really funny. And the more ridiculous the nickname, the better. Um, one of the cool things about nicknames is that it really does create a bond between two people because when you name something, you imply a certain sense of ownership and it, uh, it also becomes a type of inside joke between the two of you. 
Uh, a good example of this is one time um, I, I started dating this girl. Her name was Katie. And her email address was something like Goofy Kate, you know, 123 or something like that. And when I got emails from her, it was always, you know, from this Goofy Kate email address. So I just started calling her Goofy Kate. And eventually that got shortened to Goofy. And every time I'd see her, I'd be like, hey, what's up, Goofy? You know? And, you know, she'd laugh and, you know, whatever. But um, to me and her, it was, you know, she was Goofy. You know, that was her name. Uh, there was another girl I met where I, I used to call her um, um, Fuzzy Bunny. You know, I, I, I don't even remember why. I just called her, like, you know, like Fuzzy Bunny for no real good reason. But that, that name kind of stuck. You know, she was my little Fuzzy Bunny. And, uh, you know, as, as long as, like, you're not calling women, like, really offensive names, you know, like Bitch Slut Ho... You know, even though I have had uh, girls who I nicknamed that never to their face, but whatever, um, you know, you you kind of have this kind of endearing inside joke. Uh, um, and whenever you're in a relationship with someone, eventually nicknames like kind of pop up. So it's always good to kind of like be the first one to go out there and do that and and start uh, you know referring to them in that sense. All right, bad jokes. Good jokes are hard, bad jokes are easy. That's just the long and short of it right there. So if you're going to tell jokes, don't even try to tell good jokes. Just, just use bad jokes because they're, they're easy. You can go online and find like a billion bad jokes. Um, a word of wisdom, though, the, the shorter the jokes are, the better. Okay. And re remember uh, our little talk on immaturity a little bit earlier. First grade humor is always funny. And so if use bad jokes that, you know, would make like a kindergartner laugh. Now, it might not get you an actual laugh from the girl, but it doesn't matter because it's, it's a playful thing. It's fun, and you can also turn it into a game. So, for instance, you know, you could just look at her, like, you know, if there's a lull in the conversation or whatever, you could just say, uh, hey, why'd the monkey fall out of the tree? And she'd be like, I don't know. And you're like, because it's dead, duh. You know, I mean, that's a bad joke, but, you know, it's just something funny. And then you can be like, okay, your turn. It's your turn to tell me a joke. And then she tells you a joke, and it can be a good joke or a bad joke or whatever. And then, like, the idea is, like, you know, in the game, who can tell the, the worst joke? And an another thing I like to lump into the bad joke category are bad pickup lines. Because once you get to know a girl, like, like once you're past the point of meeting her and you're actually dating and stuff like that, bad pickup lines actually work, <laughs> you know? Surprisingly enough, they do. Like, uh, you know, you could... Um, you know, uh, meet up with a girl to go see a movie, for instance. Let's say you, you two, get, two of you get together, and uh, you're like, "Damn, girl, did you wash your pants in Windex? Because I can see myself in them." You know, I mean, like that's a really bad pickup line; it would never work. But if you already know the girl and you use that, um, she she's gonna like, you know, think it's funny. She's gonna let it go. Like I do this all the time. I take every bad pickup line I can possibly think of, and I use it when, whenever I like, you know, meet up with a girl I know. And it, it's it's really fun. It's really funny. All right. Um, another favorite tactic of mine is to steal stuff that's already funny. You know, it's hard to think of funny stuff on your own. But, uh, you know, there's tons of stuff out there that's already, like, you know, humorous and will guaranteed to make people laugh. So think of great jokes that you've heard from comedians and, and well-known celebrities and, and use them. You know, talk about them for your own gain. Tell the joke in a story as if you're impersonating the comedian. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, ha you know, people like Chris Rock and stand-up, but these guys are really, really funny. And you can even say to a girl, it's like, hey, you know, um, you ever watch Chris Rock? And she's like, oh, I love Chris Rock. And you can say, like, oh, my God, I, I saw his stand-up one time, and he has the story about, you, you know, like the, the only goal of, of a guy who has a daughter is to keep her off the, the stripper pole. And then you can actually go into the exact same routine that Chris Rock uses in his stand-up and just, like, repeat it word for word. And it's still funny. Like, women get it. You know, like, the, there's this, this whole other Chris Rock uh, thing about having the, the, the dick in the jar. You know, like how every woman has, like, a guy friend who, in case she breaks up with her cor current boyfriend, she goes to him and, uh, you know, just uses him at, for the rebound. And he calls that the dick in the jar, you know, break in case of emergency. So... You know, I have I love Chris Rock's stuff, so I have a lot of his stuff kind of memorized so that, you know, if there's a lull in the conversation or I want to make the girl laugh or talk about something funny or take the conversation in a new direction, 
I can just pull out, you know, something I love from Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, Robin Williams, you know, whoever, and just start, you know, reciting it word for word and maybe even do an impression of them while I'm doing it. So steal stuff that's already funny. It works really good. Okay, now let's talk about self-depreciation, okay? This is the type of humor where you're basically making fun of yourself. And, of course, people love ridicule as long as it's not directed at them. Now, self-depreciation humor actually does a lot of good things on, on your behalf because um, if, if you're able to be self-depreciating, uh, it shows that you're cool because you can poke fun of, at yourself and not get upset. And women really like it when a guy has the ability to kind of make fun of himself because it shows that he's not pompous, that he's not, he doesn't have hubris, and that he's confident enough to kind of, you know, take a licking and, and not kind of get angry or upset because whenever someone gets made fun of and they get upset about it, it shows that there's some type of um, problem with their self-esteem. So people with low self-esteem can't tolerate being made fun of. So if you can tolerate being made fun of, and in fact you make fun of yourself, that shows that you have you know, some measure of confidence and that you're a cool guy. Now, on the flip side of this, uh, it's also a great defense mechanism. Uh, so, like, let's say someone criticizes you, uh, or, you know, what, whatever. Let's say you're out on a date, and, and, you know, you have a run-in with some dude, and he starts making fun of you, or criticizing you in some respect. Um, what you can do is you can agree with whoever it is that's criticizing you, and then take it to a ridiculous extreme, you know. Um, this is really important, because this is where the humor comes in, but it's also a good way to deflect whatever criticism uh, someone is heaping on you. So... Let's say you know you run into some guy and he and you know he wants your chick or whatever and he's like, dude, you're 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 a freaking loser, you know, like what what's she doing with a loser like you? And you're like, oh, oh my god, yeah, you're so right. Like in a few months' time, I'm gonna be like, you know, shitting in a pickle jar, you know, I just know it. But I, I can never really be as cool as you, man. Like you're such a cool guy. Can you teach me how to not be a loser, please? Like you know, you know, in fact, you know, take my girl, please. You know, like she she needs to be with a winner like you. You know, so basically what you're doing is you're agreeing with the guy and you're taking it as far as it can possibly go, but in a way you're deflecting that criticism and you're making him seem like a tool all through the use of self-depreciation. Now, uh, this can also be used to kind of diffuse a mistake or, or, you know, something that you did wrong. So, like, let's say that, you know, you made a mistake or you did something stupid. Uh, you can use self-depreciation to make light of it and then diffuse, you know, the awkwardness. So let's say, uh, <laughs> let me give you an example. Um, one time I was out on a date and I accidentally, you know, farted. And it was very, very embarrassing. And it was one of those farts where, like, you heard it. You know, it, it happened. It was there. And it was obvious that, that I did it. And I just looked at her and I just said, oh, my God, I just, I totally just farted. I'm so sorry. Um, I've been eating a lot of red meat, too, so it's going to be re a really nasty one. So ho hold your nose. Go on. Pl plug it up. Hold your nose. If you smell this, you'll break up with me. I just know it. Uh, it's the type of fart that could end a marriage. You know, I, I, I basically, I pointed out the fart, and I just let it go and, and wouldn't let go of it. I, just, I, I took it to the extreme. I was just like, oh, it's going to be so nasty. It, you know, like I've been eating all the wrong food. It's going to be disgusting. Uh, you're going to break up with me because it smells so bad. It's just terrible. And so, like, you know, I, I turned what was really a kind of an awkward situation to something where she just couldn't stop laughing, you know. And, again, that was, uh, that kind of led into some recall humor later on, where it was, like, the fart that would end a marriage. And, uh, you know, she'd say stuff like, you know, like, well, you farted in front of me, and I still didn't break up with you. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, what's wrong with you? Um, so you, you can use um, stuff like that. And uh, um, I want to make the point that if you use self-depreciation, don't use it to point out your own flaws or harp on your own insecurities. You know, a lot of guys will, will try and, and use self-depreciating humor to kind of, you know, d diffuse stuff that they feel uncomfortable about. Like, let's say you have a big nose, and you make fun of yourself because you have the big nose. Um, that's not a good thing, because what you're actually doing is you're highlighting stuff about yourself that's bad, and you think it's bad, and, and you don't want anyone else to think it's bad. However, by doing that, you're basically pointing out to everyone, hey, look at all the bad stuff about me. E even if they laugh at it, uh, it it's not good. So when, when you do use self-depreciation, only use it in, as either a defense mechanism or to diffuse some type of awkward situation. 
don't ever use it to point out the fact that, you know, um, you have something wrong with you. Like, for instance, I'm not a very thin guy, you know, I'm a little bit overweight. So when I'm out with a girl, I'd never start making fun of myself for being fat because that's something that I don't want her to kind of harp on, you know, I, I don't want her to glaze over it. Now, if someone else calls me fat, then I'll, I'll go along with it. I'll just be like, oh my God, you're so right. Like, I'm totally like one step away from being Jabba the Hutt, you know. I'm going to need a slave girl really soon, you, you know. Um, so if someone else points it out, then that's when you use the self-depreciating humor, but you never bring it up on your own accord because you're insecure about it, okay? Most of the time, people won't even notice stuff that you're insecure about until you bring it up, and then they can start holding that against you because they, they know that, you know, you're kind of wishy-washy on it. So just as an aside, never use self-depreciation to point out your own flaws or harp on your own insecurities. But the biggest key to being funny is to have fun. If you have fun, the humor will come naturally, okay? If you're just able to sit back and relax, not worry about anything, not worry about censoring yourself, not worrying about messing up, you will naturally, if you're an intelligent person, which I'm fairly certain that you are, be a funny person. You'll pick up on stuff, you'll crack jokes, you'll have a good time. R remember, humor is all about feelings. It's, it's not about really getting a response. It's not about making people laugh. It's about making people feel good. The better you can make people feel, the more they'll like you and the more personality you'll, you'll display. Even if you're not a funny guy, just be super, super positive. People like positivity. And if you can mix that positivity in with some fun every once in a while, uh, people will like you even more. So out of everything I, I told you about, if you can't even remember one of those little concepts about how to be funny, just have fun. The more fun you have, the more naturally funny you'll be, and the easier it'll be to make people laugh and have a good time with you. All right, guys, that's all I have for the video. I hope you really enjoyed this this thing. Um, like I said, I got most of this material, most of these concepts from girls who use them on me. Um, so this is stuff that I know for a fact girls respond to. I use all this stuff in every one of my interactions, and I always get a good response from it. So. If you need to, watch this video as many times as you want, uh, learn the concepts, and actually go out and start using them, and you'll be absolutely amazed to see the type of responses girls give you. All right, guys, this is Joseph Matthews, and I'll catch you later.